Practice Management Receipt Batch Entry. One of the features within Prognosis is the ability of users to post by batch. Now there is some behavior controlled by system level properties that need to be defined at the beginning of implementation. Then this will be applicable system wide both in practice management as well as on the EMR side wherever cache entries are entered. This would be under your EOB or ELE entry screen, patient payment, whether that would be your receipts or your co-payments, and then any other miscellaneous payments such as capitation receipts, employer receipts, and so on. A user can have single or multiple batches open at any given time based upon local workflow. Now the benefit of batch entry would be for productivity tracking, and this also would be based on local needs and workflow. You can track at a user level, you can track to match to bank deposits, and any other need that you have within the practice. So to create batches, I'm going to toggle into Prognosis. You'll see that I'm logged in here as my biller, Quinn Perkins. Now by default, anybody who has billing access will have access to create batches. Now I mentioned that there is some system behavior that needs to be defined. Typically this is going to be defined during your implementation and setup and it does require administrative access. So we're going to go up here under our settings tab and choose configuration and then go to admin properties in our upper right column. And we're just going to filter it to our billing parameters and search for the word batch. Now you'll notice we have quite a few here. The most important one here would be user-wise batch number. Typically is going to be defined to yes because then that means each user who is logged in will have his or her own batch numbers. If this value is set to no, then that means anybody within the practice can use the same batch number. So for user level productivity, it's better to set this value to yes. In order to use receipt entry batch at the system level, it does need to be turned on. So if this is set to no, then what we're discussing will not even be a factor in your practice. Now these next couple here for entry batch are for claims, so you can skip those. Multi open batches, notice that we have our set to yes. This is if you would like each user to have the ability of entering to more than one batch at a time. A batch is open until a user closes it. Depending on your workflows, you may decide to have one batch per calendar day, one batch for deposit date, one batch per insurance. That could vary, of course. So it's going to be based upon your local workflows as to whether a user should have one or more open batches at any given time. And then our next two determines the batch number. Now, as we're going to see in just a moment when we create a batch, the system will automatically assign the batch number based on these two settings. You can dissociate a prefix. Uh, in this example, I'm showing you MMYY, which means every batch generated will start with the month and the year. You can also change that to LF for last name, first name, and it would take the user's initials. Since I'm logged in as Quinn Perkins, for instance, it would put PQ. And then the batch number length is going to be a system generated incremented by one numeral value for each batch created. So these properties will be set at a system level to control the auto assigning of batch numbers. Now that said, I am going to show you when we create a batch that you can override these parameters on a batch by batch basis. So I'm just going to go into the create batch screen now. And this is done under our settings option. I'm going to select receipt batches. Now you'll notice that there's also an option for claim batches, which is the subject of a separate video. Now it initially invokes the search screen of all existing batches, whether they are opened or closed. I'm going to go ahead and click the add new button. This brings up an empty batch screen. Now you will notice in the upper left, there is a batch number field. Now this will be assigned by the system based on the properties that you have predefined, but you also have the ability of overriding it upon each new batch entry. Now in this particular scenario, you'll see that mine is beginning with the current date, November 15, meaning the year 2015, because that is the behavior I have currently defined in my property to start every batch with the month and the year. Or within your practice, you can devise your own internal workflow. Maybe, for instance, you want to track batches that start at the front desk so that you can keep your EMR collections separate. So you can actually just put in front desk. Maybe you want to track your patient payments separately from your insurance payments. So again, you can override this at your preferences. However, 
If you do not define it manually, the system will automatically increment the batch number based on the properties that we just discussed. You'll notice the next definition here is collection location. Every practice has at least a primary location identified by CL for clinic location. In my example, that is on the Bay Clinic. If you have multiple locations, you do have the option of creating batches unique for each location. If you don't care about them being location specific, then you can let it default to the system CL and post any location within that single batch. Comments are available for local discretion if you would like to enter any kind of special comment for that specific batch. It is not a requirement. Now you'll notice my open date is defaulting to the current date. It's important to note that whenever you enable batch entry within your practice, that will become the driving force for all of your collection related reports as the posting date. As opposed to if you do not use batch entry, you're able to manually indicate a posting date. The close date is open-ended and we will discuss that at the end of the video. Now you'll notice within my batch entry mode, I do have a table here that is going to track my productivity throughout the day. It's broken out by transaction type. Remittance is going to be your insurance monies and that would be reflective both of your electronic remittances as well as your manual remittances. We've got our patient receipts, capitation receipts. Copay is going to be reflected whether it's collected up front on the clinical side or within the back end. You have the copay screen on the billing side as well, although typically that is going to be reflective of your front desk collections. And then for those of you who use our employer and collection agency workflows, you have the ability of tracking those receipts separately also. And then on the right hand side, you'll notice we have a couple of report options uh, as well as our EOB check detail. I'm just gonna go ahead and create my batch here for Quinn and we're gonna say we wanna use our initials and I'm just gonna say that it is my second batch of the day. Now that I have created my batch, it is going to be applicable system-wide on all of those cash entry screens. So whether I wanna post an insurance check or a patient check, it is now going to force me to assign a batch number. If not, it is going to give me an error that I cannot post the transaction. So to demonstrate that, I'm gonna go out here to my remittance patient receipt screen and we'll just say we got a check in the mail for an outstanding balance. So we're going to go ahead and create his batch. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the specifics on the receipt because that is handled in a separate video. But you'll notice here in the, in the receipt header, there is a batch number field. The plus sign is grayed out and therefore my pick list is enabled. That is an indication that I have at least one open batch for Quinn Perkins. And if I click that pick list, you'll notice all of the open batches I have to choose from. Now, if there are no available open batches, instead of the pick list being enabled and the plus sign being disabled, it will be the reverse. This allows the user to create a batch within their first transaction without having to go under settings configuration and set the batch up first. I can demonstrate that by logging in as my other biller who doesn't have any open batches. Now this time you'll notice what I was just explaining. My batch number is disabled, but my plus sign is enabled. And that is an indication that Leslie has not yet created any batches for the day. So if she's already begun creating her remittance header and she doesn't want to stop what she's doing to go out under the separate menu option, the plus sign is a shortcut to let her go ahead and create one at this point. Now again, it is going to read the system level parameters, however, and assign that batch. In this example, notice it didn't insert Leslie's initials, but it started with the month and year because that is the system default parameter I have defined. Now I'm gonna go back in there to my batch header. We're gonna look at one of my older ones that already has data posted in it so that we can see data on our reports. So over here on these three buttons on the right, I'm gonna click the top button, which is my batch report. Now this is going to be specific to that batch only. You'll notice that it has given me the ERA number that this batch is assigned to. And if you are allowing a certain batch to have more than one ERA within it, you will have multiple entries here in this table. The ERA number will be hyperlinked to allow you to view the transaction details within each remittance. But you'll notice my breakdown here based on the payer I associated how much came in as cash, how much came in as credit card, how much came in as check, 
how much was an electronic remittance, and then my total. And at the bottom, you have the ability of either printing this report or exporting it as a common delimited file, which you could then do some external data massaging if needed. Now our second button is similar, but it's broken out by mode of payment only. This is a one line entry by method of payment, which can be compared to your bank deposit to verify the dollar amounts of check, cash, credit card, or electronic payment. And then we have our third option, which is EOB checks. Now this is a very useful feature, especially when you're dealing with the manual EOBs or checks. Electronic remittances, of course, are automatically attached when the electronic remittance is uploaded into your system. And you have the ability of looking both at the raw electronic format or the pre-printed format. In the case of manual EOBs, however, you need to manually scan and attach those or they're not going to be part of the system. So in this scenario, you'll notice that on this old remittance that I've chosen, my magnifying glass icon is grayed out. That's an indication that this particular EOB was never scanned and attached. Since this batch is already closed, I do not have the ability of attaching it after the fact. So I'm just going to go back in here now and open up my current batch, which I've not yet closed. And when we click our EOB check button, you'll notice this time all of my fields are enabled. So this allows me to enter all of my EOB data, including the payer, the check number, and so on. Notice now I have a paper clip as well as a scan button. So my choices are going to be to either go ahead and directly scan it in real time by clicking the scan button. Now that of course would require that you have the appropriate scanner properties defined. Uh, this is handled in a separate video called One Touch Scan. Or if you have already scanned it to a directory on your shared network drive or your local workstation, you can click the paper clip, navigate to where you have saved that image, and then you can attach it from there. That will then enable the magnifying glass so that you can view the attachment at whenever time you want. But more importantly, if you notice the system now assigned the ERA number, this automatically opened the batch header with the attached EOB. So based on your workflow, this is very beneficial for those of you who may be part of a billing service and maybe you're not even on campus with the practice, but the insurance is sending the EOBs directly to the practice. So you can have a workflow instituted where the front office person or the office manager actually goes ahead and attaches the EOBs in this fashion. It will therefore create the ERA for you. And then as the cashier, what you will do instead of going under your batch creation is go in here to your unallocated remittance, locate the batch. And then when you open that batch header, you will notice the magnifying glass icon is enabled, which allows you to view the EOB. And then of course, from there, you could post the money. When using receipt batch entry workflow in your practice, closing the batch is going to be the last thing you do. Now, depending on the properties that we've discussed in the beginning, if you are using user wise batch, only the user assigned to that batch will be able to close it. So I've logged back in here as Quinn Perkins. I'm going to go back into my receipt batch and open the batch that we've been working on. In the upper right, we have the close date. Now I mentioned at the onset that the close date is open-ended. This is going to vary from one practice to another based on your local workflows and how you're using the receipt batch entry within your practice. This could be on a daily basis. It could be on a deposit level basis, an EOB level basis, a user basis, whatever has relevance in your practice. The important thing to remember is that as long as a batch is open, it can be used. This will impact your reports. Remember the open date of your batch is what is reflected as the posting date. Six months down the road, when you're doing analysis or trying to get some collection reports, you want that data to be reliable. So you're going to want it to be on a closed batch basis so that the data is not fluctuating in time. So once you have decided that the time is right to close the batch, you simply enter the date and save it. Now that that batch is closed, it can no longer be used to enter transactions. Now you'll notice at the bottom, I do have a reopen button. For extenuating circumstances, there is a special user role that can be given to those who need it so that if the batch does need to be reopened for modification, it can occur. So in review, 
If you are going to use receipt batch entry within the practice, there are some system properties that may, need to be defined up front when you're initially implementing the feature. That will then control the batch module throughout your practice for all users. Within these properties, you have the ability of determining if you want to permit single or multiple batches per user. If you do single batch entry, each batch will have to be completed and closed before a new batch can be opened. This will be applicable across the system at all cash entry screens, whether that would be your EOB or electronic remittances for insurance, your patient payments, or your other payment screen. And then the benefit to you would be at a productivity level, you can have user level tracking, you can produce the mode report, so you can balance to your bank deposits to make sure all of your cash and credit card and check entries balance or whatever other local workflows you have, the batch number fields are available for your custom report layouts.